Our reading today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 11. Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. The word of the Lord. Let's be to God. So I wonder uh, if any of you have had the same experience as me. Uh, last week, we kicked off this, uh, which is uh, our 30 days of prayer for the beginning of the year. We're praying through the month of January. Uh, it's not too late to jump in. If you missed that, you can grab one of those in the, in the lobby. But as part of that, we've been praying a particular psalm every morning. And when we kicked off last Sunday, I was pretty sure I knew what was going to happen for me uh, in this 30 days of prayer. After all, like, I literally, like, typed this, right? So, like, I was like, okay, I'm going to read a psalm, and I'm going to kind of be encouraged. I'm going to get, like, a little spiritual, emotional boost at the beginning of my day, and it's going to be awesome. Um, that is not what actually happened. What actually happened for me is that I have found myself in the last week confronted, in a good way, but nonetheless confronted by the words of scripture that we've been reading. And specifically in the area of the disconnect that exists between uh, usually verse one of each psalm that we've read and what my actual life looks like as I go throughout the rest of my day. So we've read Psalms uh, this week, if you've been reading along, that say things like this. Psalm 42, as deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for your God. Psalm 89, I will sing of the steadfast love forever with my mouth. I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 25, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. And then today, uh, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. And as I've read each of those, I've had to come to terms with the question, is this actually true for me? Does my soul pant like a thirsty animal for the presence of God? Am I lifting up my soul to God, or am I just, in fact, going about my day as if he almost doesn't exist? Am I constantly declaring his faithfulness? Am I earnestly seeking him, or am I really just expecting him to bless whatever activities I've kind of predetermined already? I've been forced to ask those kinds of questions, not in a way that's laced with condemnation, but just in a self-awareness way. I thought I was probably living one way, but as it turns out, as I've read the Psalms, I might be living a different way. It's been really challenging in a way that kind of took me by surprise. It's all part of this uh, teaching series that we're in for the month of January called uh, Hungry. It's also our church theme uh, for 2022. So uh, if you weren't here last week or you've missed this, this is uh, a theme that's going to carry us all the way through the year. We have a theme each year. This is it. And it's because we're convinced that this is one of the things that we most deeply need as followers of Jesus in this cultural moment, a deeper longing, a deeper hunger for God and his ways. But in order to actually do that, in order to say yes to that, to embrace that, it requires awareness. 
It requires awareness that the things that we're currently doing, our current environment, might not be quite as life-giving as we thought it was. I remember uh, back one winter, about eight or nine uh, years ago, that particular winter, in a pre-COVID world, I was um, getting just a lot of colds and a lot of flus, and I was kind of fed up with being sick and was complaining to a friend of mine. And I trusted this particular friend, and uh, she said to me, you know what, you should take this nutritional uh, supplement. It's great. I never get sick when I take it. I always feel awesome. It was actually in the lobby at, at church. And then another friend came along and said, oh, yes, I take that too. It's awesome. You should, like, get on the train with this uh, supplement. And I thought, well, I guess I've got nothing to, eat, to lose. I, uh, I ordered the supplement. Uh, I took it one day. And uh, within about 10 minutes, I could tell something wasn't right. Um, this nutritional supplement was so good that it caused me to spend the entire day in the bathroom. Um, now, I'm not against supplements, by the way. I take other ones. They're fine. Um, but it was a strange thing, right? Where the thing that was supposed to help me so much and actually solve my problems did the precise opposite. And I share that uh, story uh, because sometimes the same can be true in other parts of our lives. That there are things that we think are going to bring us joy and well-being and security, but actually do the reverse. The point of this series, though, the point of what we're looking at this year, is there actually is something that does work. There's this pattern in Scripture that we see over and over again, where our hunger for God, our hunger for his presence, leads us to a place of intimacy with him. And in that place of intimacy, we're poised, we're in the context, we're in the environment for the possibility of breakthrough. And again, as we said last week, breakthrough might look different ways. It might look like a circumstance that doesn't change, but an increasing peace from God within it. And so that's what we're doing in these 30 days of prayer. We're cultivating that desire in our hearts. We're growing our hunger for God so that that can be possible. And each week we're looking at a different person uh, who shows us what it's like to be hungry for God. And today that person is David uh, who wrote Psalm 63. Now, if you're new to the Psalms, they're sort of the hymnal uh, of ancient Israel. Each one is a song that would have been sung in worship in the temple, and many of them uh, were written by David. Uh, David was a king, but before he was king, he spent many, many years on the run, and he was on the run from Saul, his predecessor, a bad king who wanted to kill him. Saul wanted David dead. He's pursuing him, and so David, in the moment he writes this psalm, is doing whatever he has to do to survive. And this psalm has so much to teach us. Its context is one where David is on the run. And actually, what's interesting about this psalm, Psalm 63, is that for the first followers of Jesus, those who immediately uh, were living after his death and resurrection in the first century, they would sing this psalm every single day. It was actually kind of decreed as like a ruling from the church leaders. We must sing Psalm 63 every day. It was that important to them. So we're going to uh, take a look at it, and it actually follows the psalm, uh, this layout, this cycle that we've been thinking about where David's hunger leads him to a place of intimacy with God and poises him for breakthrough. Again, the psalm, it takes place in this hostile environment. It's in the wilderness of Judah that he writes this. And David gives us this image of a parched traveler. Just listen to the desperation in his voice. He says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Why? He says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. David isn't using understated language. He's not saying, oh, you know, I'm a tad thirsty. I could use a little sip of water. He's saying, no, God, I am desperate. He's having this wilderness experience. Wilderness, this experience that's not actually unique to David. The people of God before him wandered through the wilderness waiting for the promised land. After David, Jesus would live in the wilderness for 40 years days fasting and seeking God. And maybe even today, some of us feel like we're in the wilderness. 
Maybe that wilderness for you is a broken relationship or a grief from the death of a loved one. Maybe the wilderness is uh, sickness or ill health or the surprise of unemployment or some other thing. The wilderness is this lonely place where we feel isolated, separated from others, maybe even separated from God. The wilderness can be sort of an emotionally difficult place too, without joy, where we're confused. Scripture often uses the word downcast. But in moments of wilderness, we have this instinct as human beings. There's this sort of search that takes place in our hearts because when we're in the wilderness, surprisingly enough, we don't want to stay there. We want answers, we want meaning, we want security. And so David begins to do that. He says, here I am, I'm facing an incredibly hard time in my life, but the thing that I realize I need the most is the presence of God. Now, it's a beautiful idea, isn't it? It's, it's poetic. You might say David is really in touch with his feelings. His, he's emotionally healthy. He's self-aware. He knows what's going on, and that's true. But the thing I think he wants us to notice is not his emotional health, but rather, what is the object of his desire in the wilderness? Because David in Psalm 63 is not looking for his circumstance to change, though I'm sure he would love that. He's seeking the presence of God. It's this counterintuitive thing, this counterintuitive reality, but I love what uh, Pastor Charlie Dates tells us about it. He says, I once thought, that Psalm 63, my soul thirsts for you, was an occasional feeling that every believer had. But the truth is, every person thirsts for God every day. But our thirsts pretend satisfaction with lesser deities. It can take years to realize that only one cup quenches the soul. What David and uh, Charlie Dates are showing us is that in one way or another, we're all hungry for something. And that's true whether you've been following Jesus all your life or you're kind of brand new to faith and exploring. If that's you, we're so glad uh, you're here. Welcome. But in one way or another, we're all looking for satisfaction. We're all looking for fulfillment, and yet most often we go looking for it everywhere but in the presence of God. We say to ourselves, if I can just have blank, then everything will be okay. I wonder for you, what is that blank? We run after that thing. Maybe it's a relationship. You're looking for a spouse. Maybe it's more money, a promotion. Maybe it's a thing, a car, a house, a thinner, better looking body or whatever it might be. If I can just have blank, then everything will be okay. And we probably don't say it like that, right? You don't on the phone with your friend and be like, hey, if I could just find this thing, then my life will be awesome. We don't say it that explicitly. But it's there. It's there in the ways we spend our time. It's there in the ways we spend our money. It's there in the things we complain about. Just think about that. What's the thing you've complained about most this week? Maybe that's what fills in the gap. It's also there in the things that we celebrate and that are important to us. And when we look at that, we see quite quickly what's actually most important to us. The thing that we actually believe will satisfy our hunger. And yet, even when we get it, aren't we always still hungry? It's kind of like fast food, right? It offers us something yummy. It offers us something delicious. We maybe even enjoy the taste of it in our mouths, but pretty soon after fast food, we're hungry again and feeling a little crappy. And that, for me, has been part of the confrontation of this last week. That naturally, what I go looking for is the spiritual equivalent of fast food. The things that will give me a quick fix, make me feel good. And that actually pursuing God and his ways come lower down my list of priorities more often than I would like. 
For me, it's predictably the same place. It's in the arena of performance and achievement. When I feel productive, when I feel like I'm getting things done, things are going well, then life is great. Everything will be okay. And when that's not happening, life can seem pretty hopeless. And so that's the challenge of this opening verse, is to not simply live by those defaults, by not, have our, not having our desires and our lives defined by all of those other things, whatever they may be, whether it's success or worldly comfort or keeping up appearances, but instead, first and foremost, have our lives and our desires defined as an experience of who God is. Why? Because that's where we find actual, real-life satisfaction. And that's what David tells us uh, in the very next verses of the psalm, verses 2 through 6. He talks about this intimacy that he's found in the presence of God, that he's beheld the power and glory of God, that God's love is better than life, that he will bless God as long as he lives, and that his soul will be satisfied. His hunger leads him to a place of intimacy. In other parts of scripture, uh, David is described as a man after God's own heart. That he comes out of this place of closeness and intimacy with God. And it's from there that he can make bold claims like these ones, especially the claim, your love is better than life. Again, David's not just being cute or poetic. That's the real cry of his heart. David is saying, given the choice between being alive but not having the presence of God and being killed by Saul but having the presence of God, he says, I'll choose the latter. Now, to be candid, isn't that a jarring statement? I'd rather be dead but have the Lord than be alive and not have him. It's possible, likely even, that we might look at something like David's level of passion and commitment and say, that's a bit extreme for 2021, isn't it? It's a bit unbalanced, not especially normal. Actually, I wonder if it's a moment for us, in Christians in North America, to look in the mirror. Because maybe it's not David that's abnormal when he makes that statement. Maybe it's us. For David, there's this incredible value and worth in the pursuit of the presence of God. It's like treasure to him. Is worth giving everything for, and he's not the only person who's had that experience. I wonder, have you, have you ever stopped to realize what a massive anomaly this is? And what I mean by that is that the scene we're in right now as we sit here, which is great, by the way, I, I love it, but it would be absolutely unrecognizable to most followers of Jesus throughout human history, right? The default way of being and doing church in North America is, is usually some version of this, right? And so th this is what, what pa pastors kind of have in their mind a lot of the time. Make it easy, make it attractive, have a few demands on people's lives, but not too many. Make it entertaining, put on a show, be driven by consumer choice, go for a moderate amount of passion, some commitment, some buy-in. And I get that. That's the, the world that we're living in. But on the flip side of that, the reason that we're here today, 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the reason that the global church is actually stronger than it's ever been, the reason why millions and millions of people are experiencing hope in the midst of a difficult world has nothing to do with modest commitment. It has everything to do with the fact that we're standing on the shoulders of people who had this visceral hunger for the presence of God. And it's not just something that happened in the past, it's happening today too. Back in uh, August, I was so uh, both grieved and sobered of reports of Christians in Afghanistan as the U.S. was exiting. And uh, this is one report that I saw uh, about where they were at. 
uh, Soren wrote, at the moment, we are praying desperately for friends in the house church movement in Afghanistan. Their courage is immense. Most expect to meet Jesus face to face in the next two weeks. It's a powerful reminder right now of what matters, making every opportunity count for eternity. Wow. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? So different than our reality. It's an amazing resolve that those followers of Jesus had. Their wilderness wasn't going to get fixed this side of eternity. See, what we're talking about in this series, what we're talking about today, isn't anything like the prosperity gospel. It's not saying everything is always going to be happy and easy. What it is talking about is the fact that even in our deepest wilderness, the love of God sustains us. That's what David's talking about in Psalm 63 when he says, your love is better than life. Now, when we hold up those images, when we say, look at David, and he says, your love is better than life, when we hold up Christians in other parts of the world who have it so much harder when it comes to the freedom of worship than we do, we could legitimately say, that is amazing, that that's what's going on in their hearts, but I just don't think I can say, your love is better than life with any integrity then. And that's true. Because ultimately, no matter our context, no matter our environment, actually none of us can say that 100% of the time. None of us can actually live a life where we can truly say, without fail, your love is better than life. The reality of sin and brokenness means we actually love life more than we love God a lot of the time. But there is a person for whom that statement is and always has been completely true. Ultimately, the person who could say with complete authenticity, your love is better than life, is Jesus. Jesus, if you read Psalm 63, he's actually the, the true, the ultimate singer of that psalm. You can read the whole psalm as if it's coming from the lips of Jesus. His hunger for God led him to this place of intimacy, and it would ultimately lead him, yes, to face a death that he did not want, but even in his death, he would experience ultimate power and breakthrough when he rose. And because of that, Jesus can say to all of us who are hungry, all of us who find ourselves in the wilderness of false hopes and false promises, he can look at us and he can say, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Friends, don't you want that? Both David and Jesus remind us that being in God's supernatural presence is actually the thing that meets our deepest needs. It's actually the thing that changes our reality. As my prior church used to say all the time, one touch from the king changes everything. That's all it takes, one touch. Meaning when we're in this place of intimacy with God, breakthrough can actually happen. Now, David's breakthrough probably looks a good deal different than ours. For him, his breakthrough was about deliverance from an army. This morning, your desired breakthrough probably looks different. It might be in your health or your career or relationships or finances. But it's so interesting when we look at David's uh, breakthrough in verses 7 through 11, because his breakthrough happens in the past and in the present and in the future. He says, you guys can hit that next slide. He says, in the past, verse 7, you have been my help. He looks back and he remembers all the ways that God has been faithful to him in the past. 
In the present, he says, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. He's writing in the present tense. Even when he's still in the wilderness, even when his circumstances haven't changed, he's still holding on to God. And then towards the end there, he says all of these they shall statements about the demise of his enemies. He's got hope and faith for even more breakthrough in the future. His hunger leads him to this place of intimacy, and that reshapes his entire experience of the wilderness. He remembers God's faithfulness in the past. He clings on to God's faithfulness in the moment of a painful time in the present, and he looks forward to all the ways that God's going to come through for him in the future. His hunger leads to intimacy, which leads to breakthrough. Uh, Just before uh, Christmas, a few days before, uh, actually Damien, who read, uh, shared a song in a WhatsApp group for our small group. And uh, it was this new album that had come out. Uh, Actually, it wasn't a a new album. It was covers of like old songs from the 90s, right? So if you grew up in church in the 90s, you would know like every single one of these songs. It was like throwbacks in a really great way. Um, And I've been listening to it on repeat ever since for the last however many weeks it's been, like three weeks. And, uh, And one of the songs on this throwback album says this. Maybe you know it. It says, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. That's really the heart of this psalm, and I wonder, can we make that our prayer today? Can we make that the thing that we're going after? I hope the answer is yes. Can we pray? Let's stand. Let's just take a moment and just uh, wait on the Holy Spirit. He's here. He wants to meet with you. He doesn't want to leave what we said just in the place of information. Uh, He wants it to be transformative. And so let's just uh, pray and just wait for him in some moments of quiet. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you meet us? We say we want more of you. We want more of your presence right now. We'll just wait and just be sensitive to what he might be saying to you or doing in you. I have a sense that for some of us, we're, we've been in the wilderness for a while. It's like we're trying to escape, but there's some kind of barrier, something preventing us. If that's you, I really, uh, I believe that the Lord wants to uh, give you an encounter with his presence that's going to sustain you however long that season goes on. And so, Father, I pray for any of my brothers and sisters who find themselves in that wilderness place, especially who've been there for a while, Lord, would you make your presence real? Would you sustain them? For any who feel weary in that wilderness experience, would you uh, fill them with sustenance and provision and energy that can only come from you? For others, you're uh, not in the wilderness today. As you've heard this, your heart's been stirred, and you're wondering, Lord, what are you asking me to do? It's like uh, someone before the service had this image of the church putting logs onto the fire, 
the fire of a burning passion for the Lord. If, if you feel like, you know, I'm called to be someone who just puts wood on the fire of what God is doing here, uh, God wants to empower you too. And so, Father, for any of us who feel uh, that call, we feel that call to put more wood on the fire of what you're doing in this county, to uh, see spiritual awakening, to see revival come to your church. Lord, again, would you speak? Would you fill us? Would you give us all that we need? The person who, who had that image had the, uh, the sense of, as we were putting wood on the fire, so the Lord was pouring oil on it. And we don't labor alone. And so, Lord, we pray for all of us. Would you birth deeper desire in us, desire for you, desire for your ways, desire for all that you have for us. Come and do that in our hearts. Transform us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.